Excellent. I think I'll get us started. I hope everybody um, who signed up made it into the Zoom room. Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. Our final session for this spring summer of uh, 2021. This fall's program um, is almost set and will be announced in the coming weeks. If you follow us uh, on our social media or are signed up for uh, on our mailing list, you'll be the first to know once it's uh, all set. This afternoon, we will focus on a new memoir of former network news correspondent Marvin Kalp assigning Russia, assignment Russia, becoming a foreign correspondent in the crucible of the Cold War. Marvin, congratulations on your new book. Um, you. We should also say that this session is co-sponsored by the Wilson Center's Cannon Institute. We're also very fortunate to have with us uh, Georgetown University's Kelly Smith, who will provide initial comments, comments and launch our discussion this afternoon. Kelly, a warm welcome. Welcome back to the Washington History Seminar. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, and I have the privilege to co-chair the seminar series with Eric Arneson of the National History Center. Today, Eric will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of two organizations, the National History Center of the American Historical Association and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. Over the past decade, the sem seminar has served as a nonpartisan forum to discuss important new historical findings, insights, and publications. Prior to the pandemic, we met on a weekly basis at the Wilson Center but we've been very pleased uh, to have come to you via Zoom and Facebook Live now for more than a year. We're delighted that many more people have in fact been able to participate in these sessions. Behind the scenes, there are two individuals who will produce this event, Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center and Peter Bierstecker for the Wilson Center. Our thanks to both of them. We'd like to acknowledge our supporters and welcome your support. Details about how to support the seminar are available in the chat room, uh, in the chat right now, and simply go to our institutional websites. A couple of technical notes. Today's session will be recorded and will soon appear on our respective organizations' websites. For the Q&A part of the seminar, we, uh, you have three options. You can, uh, and it's our preference, uh, use the raised hand function and the Zoom functionality. If you'd like to pose a question, once uh, you press the um, uh, raise hand button, you will be entered into a queue. And then Eric um, may call on you uh, in the discussion period. You will receive a prompt, um, which you will please respond to because that's required to get you unmuted. You could also uh, post a question in the Q&A um, uh, function up in my case on top of the screen uh, in the Zoom functionality. Um, and we will be happy to uh, read the question, post the question to our panelists. Finally, you could also uh, email Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org if you're following us on Facebook. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Eric, Zoom room is all yours. Thank you so much, Christian. Welcome, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce uh, our speaker and our commentator this afternoon. Our speaker, our author, is Marvin Kalb, a non-resident senior fellow with the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. He focuses on the impact of media on public policy and politics. He's also as you can imagine, an expert in national security with a concentration on US relations with Russia, Europe, and the Middle East. Mr. Kalb's distinguished journalism career spans more than 30 years and includes award-winning reporting for both CBS and NBC News as chief diplomatic correspondent, Moscow bureau chief, and anchor of NBC's Meet the Press. He went on to become a founding director of Harvard University's Joan Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. He is the Murrow Professor Emeritus at Harvard and hosts the Kalb Report 
at the National Press Club. Marvin, the Zoom room is now yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, Christian, Kelly, all of you, Rachel as well, for setting this up. And I am very, very grateful to all of you. And of course, to the people out there whom I'm addressing at the moment. Um, it has been said quite often that journalism is the first draft of history. So for all of you historians, uh, please see my intrusion now as a journalist as a proper intrusion. It also is, um, for me, journalism and history, <clears throat> excuse me, have always been kind of twin brothers. Journalism tries to get at a story as it's happening and then convey it to the audience, whether it's visual or audio, um, in as comprehensive and at the same time as compelling a way as possible. History does it long distance. History is looking back, but history is looking back at what? At an accumulation of fact and impressions. And a lot of that has been done in the last 50 years by reporters. And I find many of my colleagues who are professional historians more and more appreciative of, of the work that good journalists have done throughout the entire Cold War period. Uh, in my own case, I had every intention of being a professor of Russian history. Uh, if Harvard would have been foolish enough to give me a job, I would have grabbed it. Um, but what happened there, very fluky, but Edward R. Moreau, the great journalist from CBS, had read an article that I did for the New York Times Magazine about Soviet youth. He liked it, called me, and he said, would you like to stop by and talk to me? I said, where, where are you? And he said, in New York. I said, I'm up in Cambridge. He said, come on down, be here at nine o'clock. I was there at 8.30, anxiously biting my nails, waiting for the great man to receive me. His secretary said it's gonna last 30 minutes. It lasted three hours. Murrow was intensely interested in everything relating to the Soviet Union. And I had written about Soviet youth and he wanted to know religious beliefs, political beliefs, when they were married, their sex life, everything. He really wanted to get as deeply into it as possible. And I was thrilled to be able to do that for him, obviously. As we walked out, he put his arm on my shoulder and said, Marvin, I forgot, um, how would you like to join us at CBS? Um, I was a couple of months away from completing my, my dissertation and I had promised my mother I would do it and finish it before I did anything else. But Murrow beckoned and I instantly said, yes, sir, and joined him at CBS. And within a matter of two to three years was the Moscow correspondent for CBS. At that time, this book that I've done, Assignment Russia, is focused on a period from 1957 to 1961. And I arrived in Moscow as the correspondent in May of 1960. One of the issues that absorbed me in the preceding two years was what I regarded as a rupture, the beginning of a rupture in the Sino-Soviet alliance. I have to immediately say I was in a very lonely spot. Most of the people I knew at the State Department and at the embassy in Moscow thought that the alliance was solid, strong. Yes, there might be a glitch here and there, but essentially they would stay together. If they were together, what you had was a formidable co combination of Soviet military might linked to what seemed to be an inexhaustible supply of humanity in China. The population then was close to 700 million, and Mao was said to have said, I don't know if it's true, that if there were a nuclear war, which Khrushchev was terrified of, and then as well, namely Eisenhower and Kennedy in that time period, Khrushchev said that the living would envy the dead. Mao is supposed to have said that if there were a war between Russia and the United States, 
and nuclear weapons were used, China would be involved. And even if it lost, he is supposed to have said, 300 million people, he would still be left with 300 million people and would be the most powerful nation on earth. Um, that was very much in the Kremlin's mind. And in the period of time that I'm talking about, the most fascinating figure in it all, taking Eisenhower into account, and any classy journalist I might have known, Nikita Khrushchev was the central figure in this entire drama, in my opinion. I had the luck, pure pot luck, of having literally met and talked to Khrushchev in 1956, <clears throat> at which time he nicknamed me Peter the Great because in a conversation with him about, of all things, basketball, he looked up at me and he said, how tall are you? Uh, I said, I'm three centimeters shorter than Peter the Great. He loved the line. Uh, everyone, when, when a dictator cracks a joke, whether it's a bad joke or a good one, everybody laughs. And so everybody laughed. And in their minds, I was stuck but not stuck, I was benefited by the link to Peter the Great. Because, and here I will jump to my first big story as a foreign correspondent for CBS, it was the Paris summit in May of 1960. <clears throat> Khrushchev wanted very much to have this summit. And in the back of his mind, if he could sit down with Eisenhower, he thought, he could settle just about any problem in the world. And the problem that was the bone in my throat, as he put it, was the division of Berlin sitting in the center of the, quote, German Democratic Republic. Germany was split in two during the Cold War. And Khrushchev wanted to get the West out of West Berlin. And for him, like for any Russian with any sense of history, going back to the Teutonic Knights, the idea of an invasion by the Nazis. And bear in mind when I was there, it was only 10 or 15 years after the end of World War II. The litter of that war was still everywhere. I never came upon a Russian family that had not lost any number of people in the war. And at that time, they really loved Americans. Uh, they remembered, everybody remembered what it is that the US had done to help the Soviet Union during World War II. And those packages had large USAs across it. Everybody knew it. And I traveled all over the Soviet Union alone, but having been able to speak the language, I was able to talk to people at a higher level or just the people in a marketplace. And I felt blessed to have been able to be in that position because I sensed, I thought I sensed what it is that the Russian people felt. And they did not want war with the West. They wanted to get along with the West. And Khrushchev represented their hope that this could be realized. And Khrushchev, though, as a communist, believing in the system, but at the same time understanding that the system was flawed and there had to be reform in order for it to continue. He was not reforming communism to end it. He was reforming it in his mind to improve it. And he would do just about anything to do that from virgin lands in, in the middle of Soviet Central Asia, he would do just about anything, but he had to get the bone in his throat, Berlin, out of the way. And so he thought he could do it by sitting down with Eisenhower, but on May 1st of 1960, as many of us will remember, the U-2 spy plane flew over, Sverdlovsk was shot down, uh, and the Russians had Francis Gary Powers and the wreckage of the plane as proof 
that the United States was looking in on all of their <clears throat> all of their military strength. Khrushchev, obviously a great nationalist figure, didn't like it, but he he was torn. And you could you could sense that in conversation with him. And I had one exclusive interview with him in May, uh, right outside of the French boulangerie, <clears throat> outside of the about a block away from the Soviet embassy uh, in Paris. I bought him a croissant, which he'd never had in his life. Uh, he bit into that and his face lit up like a kid wanting another bar of chocolate. He was thrilled with the croissant and I was able then to get into a conversation with him about Berlin, about the German question as it was about the possibility of reaching an agreement with an American president who was in Paris with him. He had the opportunity to talk to Eisenhower and Eisenhower gave him the opportunity by saying that the two of them could sit down without the French and without the British, the two of them. It is what Khrushchev always wanted, but because of the U2, he felt given various pressures at home that he could not accept it and he blew up the summit, went back and it was um, a sad moment in the East-West relationship, which lingered on then for a couple of years into 62, when we had not only the raw um, visual evidence of a wall being built through the heart of Berlin, but we had then the missiles being moved into Cuba and that raised the stakes considerably I was as a journalist um, in Moscow throughout the Cuban Missile Crisis and two or three times directly from Khrushchev and reading the Soviet press, talking to as many diplomats as I could, as many Russians as I could, I was persuaded that Khrushchev would do anything, one having recognized it was a blunder. How do you get out of such an obvious blunder and still retain your political position at home? He was stuck and he ended up having to pay the ultimate price in 64, he was kicked out of power. And the sad part of it um, was that for a journalist, the story, the juice went out of the story because Khrushchev was a fabulous, um, reason to, to get on the Cronkite news at night. He always said outrageous things. Um, there's a similarity there, which we might want to get into about the sort of thing that Trump did during his presidency. You, Khrushchev said outrageous things, not because he cared about what you thought, but that because he said these outrageous things, you would talk about it. He would be in the middle of your thoughts. He would be the reason you would take action. You'd be frightened by the fact that the leader of the Soviet Union possessed of these phenomenal weapons. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was September of 61, he exploded the, a huge bomb, which was designed to scare the life out of the West and out of the neutral world. But it was Khrushchev's, another of his desperate moves to try to get the attention of people to, to judge him as not only a reasonable guy, but a threat, somebody who could produce a nuclear war, which he was terrified of. Just following him around the world, following him in the Soviet Union, reading his speeches, looking at his face when he would get angry, and he was an actor, by the way, some of the anger was fake. You got no, I regarded it as um, a journalistic blessing that I had the opportunity <clears throat> to cover that kind of an individual 
in the middle of the Cold War. Um, you know, the, the old story about the American in Paris, that's one kind of excitement. But for me, the American in Moscow, which I try very hard to get into this book assignment, Russia, um, was for me a, a phenomenal assignment. And I bless Edward R. Murrow for making it possible. <laughs> Thank you very much for those introductory remarks. And now I'm delighted to introduce our commentator slash discussant, Kathleen Kelly E. Smith, who is professor of teaching at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. She received her PhD in political science from UC Berkeley and is the author of two books on memory in Russian politics, Remembering Stalin's Victims, Popular Memory and the End of the USSR, published in 1996, and Mythmaking in the New Russia, Politics and Memory in the Yeltsin Era, 2002. Most recently, she published Moscow 1956, A Silent Spring, A Social and Political History of the Turning Point, uh, a key turning point uh, in uh, a year in Russia, uh, a, a book that we discussed in the Washington History Seminar back when we were meeting in person at the Wilson Center. Currently, Dr. Smith is engaged in a new research project on the writer's village created by Stalin. She was a Title VIII research scholar with the Kennan Institute in 1999. Uh, Kelly, the Zoom room is all yours. Yes, uh, the downside of being a teacher is that you forget you have to unzoom when you're not in the classroom. Because when you're in the classroom, you're the queen. <laughs> you're always on. Um, thank you very much, Eric and Christian, for inviting me today. Uh, they know of my special interest in the year 1956, uh, and I think they thought that, hence, uh, this would be a great pairing. Uh, I will tell you that it's a pleasure for me to pick up the story um, that Mr. Kalb started with uh, the year I was Peter the Great, which I highly recommend, you know, if you haven't taken that backward step, go back and read that one, uh, the next. So as a person too young uh, to have experienced this remarkable year in Soviet history, when I read that book, my whole experience was suffused with envy. I wanted to be the one in the reading room of the Lenin Library talking to students <laughs> in the period invasion. And I wanted to meet Khrushchev at an embassy party, you know, and, and crack a joke. So, uh, you know, it's... Um, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to recall that book and then uh, to have the pleasure of reading this uh, second volume uh, in which we learn more about uh, the experience of being a foreign correspondent, which I think we can all agree is a very distinct uh, and important role uh, in how America understands the world. We really rely, uh, even today when people don't seem to take the media uh, to heart as much as they used to, but we really rely on our foreign correspondents um, to get us closer uh, to our topics. But I was also struck in reading this book, um, and uh, Marvin has already referred to this, uh, about the role of luck. In fact, uh, if I were giving the book a subtitle, I would have called it The Story of a Lucky Guy. <laughs> the impression of always being uh, in the right place at the right time. But even more so, I think it's more than luck. I think it's an attitude of appreciation. And that's one of the notes that really struck me in reading the book was the appreciation for the people who took a chance, who were interested, who were supportive uh, along the way. And that's not really, again, that's not the image that we have of how the news business works, right? I think you know, we think that it's all competition and backstabbing and ambition and so forth. And so it was really fascinating to read about a path that was so lined seemingly with goodwill and support. Now, it may be that it's that sense of appreciation that kept replicating itself. So I would suggest that maybe there was such goodwill and support uh, because of this generosity of spirit and the appreciation uh, for people along the way. All right. Um, so usually I'll say at the Washington History Seminar, uh, you know, we talk about 
methodology and framing and connections with literature in the field, but that's really not the right angle uh, for this book because it's not an academic history per se, but it's the story of an academic who's part of history. So I decided uh, that perhaps the right thing to do today would be to kind of kick off our discussion by asking a few questions. And some of these questions come directly from reading Assignment Russia, uh, and then a couple are going to be more broadly about journalism in the 50s and 60s. And here, like a good historian, I have to have a footnote. Uh, definitely my understanding of journalism is informed by this brand new book by the historian Dina Feinberg uh, called Cold War Correspondence, uh, which I also recommend. She analyzes the life and work of American journalists in Moscow alongside those of Soviet journals lists in America. So it's a very interesting juxtaposition uh, and definitely gave me some more uh, food for thought. All right. So, Marvin, I'm going to hit you with some questions. I think we'll do some question and answer and then we'll turn it over to everybody else. Instead Let's of go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the first thing I already mentioned, they your book gives us insight into the success of an optimist. In reading your book, I immediately wanted to assign it to all my MA students because I felt like you were always ready to take a chance. Why not try and write book reviews for a major publication? You know, why not try journalism? Why not apply for a brand new program that's going to send CBS reporters on sabbatical uh, around the world? seemed like there were so many times where you took a chance, you risked rejection, and yet you succeeded. So I want to know more about what inspired this attitude. Was it part of, you know, a sort of American dream that was passed to you from your parents being immigrants to the U.S.? Did it have something to do with the sense of the time, with maybe you know, a decrease in sort of class barriers or religious prejudice in the U.S.? Or was it not really something you thought about when you, you know, went after these chances? Um, let me first say that it took a little while before I put you and your name together with your terrific 1956 book. I read that when it came out and loved it, absolutely loved it. And we cross paths without any doubt. Uh, in answer to your specific question, let me try to answer it as openly as I can. I love this country. I love the United States. I have spent a lot of time in other countries and I always end up thinking no matter how bad, we did this, this, that, and the other, um, we ended up on the right side. One of the reasons I was so pained by the Trump presidency was that my image of the country that I love, and most important in terms of answering your question, my mother and father loved. My father came here in 1914, my mother in 1913, from an environment in Eastern Europe that was filled with religious hate, with a denial of economic opportunity, with cultural rape. And when they got here and realized that they had the opportunity, quote, to succeed, whatever that means for each individual, but they had the opportunity they gave that to me and I ran with it. And I ran with it, you're absolutely right. If an opportunity was there, take it. That doesn't mean, by the way, I stress opportunity. That doesn't mean they're gonna give it to me. Far from it, I was turned down any number of times. But when there was an opportunity to go to Moscow and Marshall Shulman um, said to me, the State Department needs somebody. When I called my mother and father and I said, hey, what do you think I should do? Bingo, go for it. Wow. The idea that I would be representing the United States of America, me, 
representing the United States in the Soviet Union, that was for them, um, I don't know how to put it, they were proud as can be. And I was determined to try to do as good a job as I possibly could. So when I went there, I realized that I was blessed with the language. I studied that in graduate school and did reasonably well at it. I knew the history of this country. At the Russian Research Center at Harvard, they were fabulous in preparing us to face the reality of the Soviet Union. And then I had this job in Moscow with the embassy for 13 months. I traveled all over that country because it was there. It was the nation that represented the fundamental challenge to the United States of America, and I wanted to learn about it. I wanted to share ideas with Ambassador Boland. I wanted what I experienced on my own traveling all over the country to get to the right people at the State Department so they can make the right decisions. But Kelly, you are not only a terrific scholar, but you're a very sensitive person and you hit something right on the head and I thank you for it. Thanks, thanks. Well, my next question is a little bit different. Um, I'm gonna read a little quote from the book for those who haven't read it yet. Uh, in the book you write, in those days, reporters were young men, not women, each captivated by the Murrow mystique, most burning with ambition, some slightly terrified, but all determined to make the world a better place. No one seemed older than 30 and everyone had at least a baccalaureate. So as you can guess, when I read this, I was a little bit surprised. Now I'll admit I am not of the era of Edward R. Murrow. I had to use Wikipedia to read about the Murrow boys. <laughs> but, uh, and here I, I think I know more about Russian history than American history. I thought but there were lots of women that, that wrote about Russia in the early days, you know, starting with Louise Bryant and Anna Louise Strong, and there was, you know, great World War II correspondence and so forth. So my next question to you is, where are the women uh, in the Cold War period? Now, I'll say that when you describe these wonderful sessions, getting deep background with the ambassador, you did mention uh, two women correspondents, um, Priscilla uh, Johnson and Aileen Mosby. But I think they were primarily print journalists. And so that's my question. Was it that women weren't in radio and TV, or was there really just not very many women at all uh, in the press in this time period? What happened at that particular time, I was describing my arrival uh, at CBS as a reporter, not just as a writer. This was in 1959, 58, 59. When you went into um, the newsroom at CBS at that time, I was describing it accurately. They were all men. Mm. There was one woman editor on the radio desk. Uh, and that was the only one that I remember. In the late, in, excuse me, in the late 60s, early 70s, at CBS, there began to be women correspondents. I'm not saying there might not have been one or two earlier, but that's when they began to be seen on air quite regularly. I mean, people like Diane Sawyer. Um, um, oh God, I'm, I'm, being as old as I am, I forget names now. But there were, there were a number of women who were emerging at that time. But back in the late 50s, they just weren't there. Mm -hmm. And writing about that now, I put that line in, there were no women. It's true. And, and when you think about that, you say, good God, that's terrible. Or why not? And, and all I can say to the people who throw their hands up and discuss and say, why not, is that is the way it was. And there was a buildup of women in the early 70s. By the, by the 1980s, you could find as many women as editors and producers as men. And then it was a matter of the woman becoming the anchor person. And there were a couple who made it. 
um, and made it very big. And now that, of course, continues. But back then, we were in another world. Yeah, that's really fascinating. It was really, you know, eye-opening to me. I had not pictured the newsroom mm -hmm. quite okay. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let me ask one more question, and then I think we'll probably uh, go to the audience. Um, but so the next question I want to ask is drawn more from reading this book about Soviet correspondence as well as American ones. Uh, and Dina Feinberg really digs into what changes after Stalin, the thaw. I know this is a topic near and dear to both of our hearts, you know, to see the changes uh, that came as part of the Khrushchev era. And she notes that for both Soviet and American journalists, they were able to do more stories about daily life. They also had more information to official or more access to official information, press conferences, briefings, et cetera. Um, and she suggests that they both faced a little bit less fear about mingling with each other. That before, Soviets, for good reasons, were very cautious about talking to foreigners. And when we think of McCarthyism, it may be that uh, our foreign correspondents were also a little bit anxious, right, about the connections that they made. So I'd like to hear a little bit about the contact between uh, American and Soviet journalists. Did you mix socially or professionally? Did they act as colleagues? Did you ever, you know, exchange information in this time period? I'd like to answer that question with a preliminary uh, comment. The idea that you make a comparison between the American reporter working in Moscow during the Cold War and the Soviet reporter working in Washington during the Cold War. Um, I find asymmetrical. I find it um, unacceptable. There is so fundamental a difference between the two worlds, starting with the fact that most, I'm not saying everyone, most Soviet reporters working in Washington in the early 1960s during the Cold War were spies. And if they weren't spies, they worked for uh, Soviet intelligence. I cannot swear about every single American reporter in Moscow, but those that I knew and myself thrown in, the idea that, that we were working with intelligence is absurd. We were not, we were reporters doing the best job we could. Now, to get to your question. Did we in Moscow try to meet Soviet reporters? The answer is that in Moscow, in that time, it was so difficult to strike up a relationship with a Soviet citizen. They were so frightened. They were so fearful that the KGB would see them with an American. Um, that was not too many years removed from the time that family members snitched on parents in order to get an advancement in, in Soviet society. Uh, it was a cruel um, system, but we tried very hard to get through to as many Russians as possible. Because I spoke Russian, I had a huge advantage. Every week I went to the central um, marketplace in Moscow, very large peasants coming in, selling their produce. I, I'm not much of a produce buyer, but I pretended to be one. And I would go and talk to these people. It was my way of getting a feel for what it is, not that Pravda told me, but what I could sense myself. That was one way of getting information. You, you didn't get um, <clears throat> news breaking information in the marketplace. You got a feel. For example, when Berlin was a hot story and the Russians were terrified of a war again between Russians and Germans. I sense that in the marketplace. 
up. And so when I did my broadcast, and I said, this is what Pravda said today. And if you went into a marketplace, this is what you would hear. That is um, an asset that I had that I tried to get into the book. The, the sense of being, of digging into the society itself. We had censorship then. An American reporter had every word was cleared by a censor. So if I wanted to get a thought that I was, um, well, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, the Russians uh, took us once to Minsk and they told us we were watching the demobilization of the Red Army. And what we saw was 30 troops who stood at attention and then at an order lifted their rifles up in the air and threw it down. And the guy who was with us said, there you see, there's proof that the Soviet Union would demobilize, but you never see this in the United States. How do I get that, that this nonsense how do I get that across? And so I said uh, in my broadcast that night, I said, 12 American reporters were taken for a ride today, this time to Minsk, where they were told that they were. Now, the Soviet censor didn't get that phrase, taken for a ride. And she simply didn't know it, so I was able to broadcast that. But that was a constant um, struggle that you had. The Soviet reporter in Washington did not have that. There was, a, you know, there were so many differences between the two. Um, anyway, so that's it. Yeah, no, I definitely agree that there are a lot of differences and that it's very sort of asymmetric in terms of censorship and so forth. But it is interesting to think about how in both cases, the correspondence really functioned as a way to, you know, sort of, right, lift that iron curtain a little bit. That oh, yes. What you knew yes. about America was based on what right. their journalists uh, told them. So, all right. Well, I think uh, I will turn it back to Eric. All right. Thank you very, very much. Um, we are going to open this up momentarily uh, to those in the audience. Uh, as Christian pointed out at the outset, there are several ways that you can participate. You can use the raise hand function that allows us to call on you and unmute you. You have to unmute yourself as well uh, to pose the question directly. You can use the raise hand, the, the uh, Q&A function uh, on Zoom, or if you're on Facebook Live, uh, you can write to uh, our weekly, um, uh, as it says in the chat. Uh, Christian will lead us off uh, with a question uh, for uh, consideration. Christian? Sure. Thanks, Eric. Um, what a wonderful book, uh, an immensely readable and enjoyable book, um, Marvin. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, let me, before we get into some of the substance that I know will be um, discussed in, in further questions, um, just ask you uh, about your sources for this book and the, the crafting of this book. Uh, there are lots of quotes uh, and quotation marks. Um, so I'm curious, was, do you have, is there a diary? Do you, are there other notes? Uh, what, what did you draw on when you recalled these events from many decades ago? Right. Um, about one quarter of the book, about a quarter of the book, concerns a trip that I made around the world, stopping at 13 different places to try to find out as much information as I could about the Sino-Soviet alliance. Because in my judgment, it was beginning to fracture apart, but in the judgment of the administration, uh, not just in the US, by the way, but in other places as well, uh, it was a very strong relationship. Um, while I went around to these 13 different countries talking to a lot of different people, I took heavy notes. I took a lot of notes. And so that is the support, plus everything that I was reading along the way uh, or had read in advance of the trip itself. Uh, that sort of is the, the uh, footnoted support, so to speak, for that part of the book. The parts of the book that had to do with family, 
um, that had to do with my wife, uh, marriage, um, what a young couple uh, tried to do in, in New York. He said that was our personal experience. And so that which I chose to share, I shared. Uh, and that's where I got that from. As far as conversations that took place um, in the newsroom, for example, um, some of those conversations were um, taking a, I have a very good memory, and I could remember the thrust of a conversation. I might not have been able to give you something word for word, but I could give you the thrust of the conversation, sometimes highlighted in my mind by a phrase that was part of a larger discussion. So that came up quite often. Also, in that early period of the book where I'm describing uh, myself as a young reporter, very much that, trying to work my way through CBS, I had a written record of what it is that I was doing. The reason I had a written record was that I was attempting to persuade not Murrow who, who wanted me, but those members of CBS who didn't want a scholar, they wanted a reporter. And so I had to persuade them that a scholar could do the work of a reporter. And so I kept notes of people um, whom I had to persuade. <laughs> and so that was sort of that part of it. The relationship of um, the, re the interview, for example, with Khrushchev, that was simply taped. So we had all of that. Um, any conversation with a Russian um, that was official was taped. So I had that. Um, I had letters. I'm sorry, that's a very important thing. I had letters that I had written to my brother. My brother at that time was a New York Times correspondent in Southeast Asia. Um, and I was in Moscow. So we would communicate by letter and I would tell him about things that happened to me and what somebody said to me. And I have those letters. Great, thank um, you. So that's essentially where that Thank comes. you, thank you. All right, let us open this up. We have a number of very patient people whose hands are raised in the queue. Uh, and first we would like to call on John Martin. So if you would unmute yourself, you may pose your question. Thank you, Eric, and, and thank you, Christian. Uh, this indeed is a wonderful book. There's so many great stories, both for historians and journalists. I think my favorite of all time is Marvin Kalb interviewing Nikita Khrushchev while walking on a sidewalk in Paris after stepping into a bakery and buying Khrushchev his first <laughs> That is an all-time favorite. Uh, as far as the question goes, it, this book also reminds me that in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s, the network evening news often carried a brief, thoughtful essay or commentary Eric Severide, Howard K. Smith, David Brinkley, and I think also Marvin Kalb, if I'm not mistaken. I wondered why commentaries disappeared and whether you think this might be a good time to revive them. John, there's no question it would be a good time to revive it. But you know, as, as well as I, as well as any good journalist, we have, the whole industry has changed so dramatically. I mean, from the time that you were running around Africa interviewing people, um, today, uh, I cannot imagine a network sending a correspondent and a team out to Africa unless there was a direct threat to the United States or American troops were somehow involved uh, or an American plane went down in Africa. You were there to cover politics. You were there to cover changes, revolutionary changes. And we simply don't have that kind of 
journal one of a number of tragedies that now befront the American people because we have to know more about what is happening around the world to assume once again the responsibility that we had up until recent time to lead the democratic world in a pro-democratic direction and not allow um, the right-wing populists to dominate our political environment. Who better than a journalist to tell us that kind of story? You can't get it from a politician today because of the split in our society where half the country doesn't believe what the other half even thinks, doesn't even recognize what a fact is or what truth is. Um, John, you've raised a key point and um, it arouses uh, emotion in me because I am pained by the absence of the kind of journalism we did today. I am not saying that what we did was perfect by any means, but we live at a time now where that kind of analysis and that kind of deep digging that you used to do is so required, is so essential to the survival of our democracy. Thank you. We have up next, Amanda Moore. If you would unmute and introduce yourself and pose a question. We need you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hear you okay. now. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the question I had is usually always books about this, but you've given us such a uh, wonderful list of books. Um, the thing about Khrushchev, where did he go after he was, quote, disposed? They were very careful after Stalin not to lop off people's heads. But, you know, where did he go and what was he doing in his final years? That's a, a fascinating question. In 1964, October 14th, I believe, uh, Khrushchev was invited into a meeting of the Politburo. He knew that there were problems. He didn't know that they had reached a point where a majority of the Politburo had voted to unseat him. And the one who broke the news to him was Brezhnev, not a particularly distinguished person by any means. Um, but he took over. And um, the Politburo and the Soviet Union had a big choice to make at that point. They could have killed him, and they could have argued that he had done horrible things to the Soviet people, that he had created unacceptable problems and had to die, and they would have killed him. But they didn't want that to happen. They wanted Brezhnev and a number of his people did not really want to return to Stalin's time. They wanted to return to something like the reforms of the Khrushchev era, but they didn't want it to go as far as Khrushchev and a number of his supporters preferred. And so what they did, which was a sign of growing political maturity in my sense, is that they allowed Khrushchev to go to a dacha, they gave him a government house just on the outskirts of Moscow, quite pleasant. Um, they gave him a car and a driver, and they gave him a very small salary. And they sent him on his way. They could have killed him, but didn't. That was a big deal. And Khrushchev then, for a period of about three or four years, lived a very quiet life, trying to adjust to an absence of power, which is a big thing for a dictator to do. He then decided he would write his memoirs. And he spent the better part of the next four years dictating memos both to his son, who by the way lives up in Massachusetts, to his son and uh, to a number of people working together with Khrushchev. And 
they ended up as two quite remarkable books that came out in early to mid 1970s. Um, and then I believe it was 73 or four that um, as a result of a series of heart uh, problems, uh, Khrushchev himself died. Thank you. Uh, Michael Goodman, you're up next. Please unmute and introduce. <laughs> Yeah, hello. Uh, yes, uh, my questions are two very uh, brief ones. Uh, you were in Moscow, apparently, during the period when relations between the Soviet Union and Cuba were gradually starting to uh, coalesce. I was wondering if you could discuss that, uh, how they uh, perceived, first perceived of Cuba as a potential uh, satellite ally. My other question is about Nicaragua, where I've read that supposedly Khrushchev developed a very strong sort of pet interest in the Sandinista movement, almost from the time that the movement, movement began in 1961, and took great interest in that country. Uh, wondering if you could elaborate any more on those points. Thanks. You're very welcome, Michael. I cannot do the Sandinista for you. I don't know enough about that. As far as Cuba is concerned, I can help um, in, in a limited way, but I can help on that one. Um, Castro, when he came to power, was seen by the United States in a rhapsodic way. The New York Times had opened the door to the impression that Castro was a very romantic figure who came in out of the mountains and kicked the bad guys out of Havana and took over. Um, for a whole year in 1959 into 1960. That was the image, but it began to erode as Castro himself began to take action that didn't look at all like it was democratically inspired. The key uh, change in the relationship between Castro and, and uh, Khrushchev came when they both met in New York in September and October of 1960. And at that time, Castro was still a flamboyant, exciting figure. And he, he took his people and set them up. I don't remember the, I think the name of the hotel was the Teresa hotel in Harlem in New York. And um, I remember vividly that the streets outside of the hotel were always packed with people who were fascinated by Castro and just wanted to see him. And he would come out on a balcony every now and then and wave and everybody would scream with delight. He would be, his people, this I saw, would cook chicken. Um, um, in pots under a flame in the hallway of the hotel. Uh, they thought that was nice and it was wonderful. Whatever the reasoning was, it produced a lot of headlines and stories. The big time was when Khrushchev went to see Castro, not the other way around. Khrushchev went up into Harlem and with Castro standing in front of the hotel, they had a great back and forth, a typically Khrushchev kind of thing. It was very dramatic, it was very exciting, a lot of phrases being thrown out, and it was on live television. They met them for three hours. What I learned later was that the relationship at that time uh, didn't exactly harden, but it began to harden because there began to be an awareness of common interest that they both had one in the other. Later, I was also told that it was in those conversations that Khrushchev developed the certainty in his mind that he could pull off one of the great stunts of all time and secretly move missiles and atomic weapons into Cuba to threaten the United States, not to use them, to threaten the United States with Castro's full support. 
And by that time in 1962, Castro had already proclaimed himself that he was a communist. Um, and the relationship with the United States fell apart and with Moscow came together, uh, aiming eventually at the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm sorry I can't do the Nicaragua thing. I just don't know enough about that. Well, speaking of Khrushchev uh, and uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, Frank Gomez posts a question in the Q&A section uh, and asks, your tour in Moscow coincided with the Cuban Missile Crisis. What did you report on it at the time? <laughs> um, that's for my next memoir, by the way. But... <laughs> Preview. <laughs> exactly. Let me tell you what I remember. Uh, first thing to say is that the Kennedy speech, the famous Kennedy speech, where he laid down the framework of what became a gigantic crisis, was done in Washington at 7 p.m., I think, Washington time, which meant sort of the middle of the night in Moscow. And the ambassador worked it out that the American reporters who were interested, and we all were, obviously, could listen to the speech at the embassy. Uh, he had a way of bringing it in. So we all heard it at the same time. and. This was after a period of intense buildup of pressure in the Soviet press about how the United States was trying to overthrow uh, the peace-loving people of Cuba. So um, it didn't come as a shock, as a total surprise to us. What was the surprise was what we learned afterward, that they had moved nuclear missiles, nuclear tip missiles into Cuba. What we knew was that they were missiles and not the people at the embassy and not the reporters knew anything about nuclear weapons at that time. But the missiles themselves were enough uh, to make it quite clear that Kennedy was challenging Khrushchev to get them out. And he was doing that in public. What does a Russian nationalist who's thinking about Germany and Berlin, but ends up in Cuba, what was on his mind? And my reporting at the time, based on conversations with Russians and diplomats, Western diplomats, Diplomats, by the way, from West European countries where there was um, a strong communist party. The reason I'm mentioning that is that in the Soviet Union, um, the Italian Communist Party and the French Communist Party had special ins with the Central Committee. And those party people used to brief members of the press who wrote for communist newspapers in both of those countries. And Western reporters, me, others, would try to have a relationship with the communist reporters uh, who were French and Italian because they had more insight from the information they were given than any of the other foreign reporters. So that was something that I spent a lot of time with and the diplomats and the Americans, but the Americans didn't really know that much. They were governed very much by what it is that was happening in Washington. Now, in Washington and around the US, kids were being taught to duck under their desks and there was the possibility of a war with Russia. In the Soviet Union, they made it a point of trying to appear normal. The kids were not being alarmed 
and the mothers and fathers were not being alarmed. What they were alarmed about was that Cuba could lead to a war about Berlin and Germany. That was on their mind, not Cuba. No one cared about Cuba. When you went into the marketplace and you said, um, uh, so tell me what's going on in Cuba today, I understand things are very dangerous. And they would sort of look at me as if they didn't even know what was happening. Um, so I, I'm simply pointing that out. And then on one occasion, I had an opportunity um, to actually talk to Khrushchev. On Wednesday of that week, <clears throat> an American opera singer was performing at the Bolshoi. Uh, his name at the moment slips my mind, but I'll think of it soon. Um, and um, that particular opera singer comes from South Orange, New Jersey, which is where my wife comes from. And we went to hear him because of that connection. I did not want to go because I thought it was idiotic for me to leave the office. But she said, let's go. And of course, in conversations with my wife over issues like that, I lose. So I immediately came and we went. What did I see at the intermission? In the large box uh, in the Bolshoi, on the second mezzanine level, there was Khrushchev arriving with half of the Politburo. After which he went down to, um, is it, was, the act, was the singer's name Jerome Hines? Uh, somebody might be able to check that. Uh, he went down, Khrushchev went down to pay his respects to an American opera singer. And I was saying to myself, I gotta get there. And somehow I did. And there was Khrushchev and the star and a couple of secret police. And then he saw me, Peter the Great once again. And I asked him, why are you here? I thought we we're in the midst of a crisis. And he said he wanted to pay his respects to the American people. And they should know that I, Nikita Khrushchev, want peace and this, that, and the other. Put aside for a second that I had a hell of a good story. He was saying something that was terribly important to an American and paying his respects to an American artist. Um, so that was a heck of a story that night. And the Thursday, the Friday, until the story broke on Sunday morning, I was in the Central Telegraph where I was broadcasting. And a Russian radio reporter, whom I knew casually, came rushing into the Central Telegraph. And he was breathless. And I asked him, what's going on? And he said, listen very carefully to the 3 p.m. news. And I put the radio that I had with me, which would bring in the 3 p.m. news into the broadcast booth. And I fed live the Russian language report at 3 p.m., which announced Khrushchev's withdrawal of the missiles from Cuba. And the minute I heard that, I was able to provide an, an immediate translation of what had happened. And I said in my broadcast immediately thereafter, I said, Khrushchev caved to, to President Kennedy. I used the, the word caved. Kennedy was furious with me for the use of that word because he did not want to. He didn't want Khrushchev to seem to be humiliated. He wanted all to sort of be on a level. And um, so Pierre Salinger called me and said um, that someone you know and respect would appreciate it if, and I told him, I'm sorry, that is what Khrushchev did in my judgment.
And so we had a hell of a story. And, um, and I still think, as I look back upon that now, that it was the right verb. Thank you. Robert Weisberg has been patiently waiting with hand in queue. If you would introduce, unmute and introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, Rob Weisberg calling from uh, Mexico City. Mr. Cobb, it is, is really a pleasure to hear you. Actually, we met a few years ago at the memorial service for Ambassador Arthur Hartman. And oh, actually, I used that occasion to open up with your comments on uh, the city dump show on the uh, CCS. Yes. Yes. Um, interesting Thanks, you very much. in our lives. My grandparents came to the U.S. from uh, Ukraine in 1913. Uh -huh. I was the first one in the family to return. I went as a student to what was then Leningrad in 1969. And 15 years later, had the honor and privilege to serve under Ambassador Hartman. Uh, it was my second diplomatic posting. And I remember writing to my aunt and saying, every single day, you should thank God that your parents got out of this country. <laughs> so I completely concur with your comments about both the Soviet Union and the United States. When I get around people who start criticizing the country, and there certainly are a lot of blemishes, we know that. But I always, when asked, say the United States has been very, very kind to the Weisberg family. I understand completely. Uh, so I thank you and echo everything you've just said. Thank you. I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm speaking more rather than asking you something, but I, I just did want to say that uh, my parents were wonderful, always admirers of you and your brother. And I grew up in a, a little town in Maryland and we could barely get the networks, but we could see them. And I learned so much from listening to you. And I, I thank you for that very, very much. And I would also say my mother didn't go to CCNY, but she went to Brooklyn College. So I think we sort of... <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Bob. Appreciate every word. Maybe next time in Washington, we can get together again. I would that would like be to. a pleasure. Thank you. And Pat Kushlis has a hand up. Please unmute and introduce. Okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Patricia Kushlis, and I was a Foreign Service officer also, served in Moscow from 78 to 80. Uh, I was working in the cultural section with exchanges, and of course we met a lot of the correspondents. And my husband was a political officer. Uh, my question to you uh, is, uh, during the time I was in Moscow, there was a, the, it seemed as if the correspondents, the American correspondents spent an awful lot of time in the snack bar, uh, <laughs> embassy officers. Uh, and when they weren't talking with embassy officers, they were talking to some of our exchanges like, uh, you know, the people then like Rob Weisberg and uh, some other friends of mine now. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, you didn't mention them as so really as sources, but I was wondering if they, if these people did contribute to your reporting. Uh, thank you very much, Pat. I, I do remember that um, cafeteria <laughs> in the back of the embassy was incredibly valuable to both me and my wife uh, during our time there. Um, <clears throat> um, I gotta be a diplomatic correspondent in answering your question. And let me try to do it in the following way. There's an ideal way of um, covering the Soviet Union, it was, and there was a way that was imposed on us by the reality of the system itself. When there was censorship of our copy, that meant that we had to live essentially in the central telegraph because there were times when it would take hours before they would clear our copy. Um, and so we gathered together and would share a great deal because we kind of lived with one another. When censorship ended and we were able then to go out into the streets to go to parties, to go to receptions and meet Russians, <clears throat> or meet them. For example, I, I used to attend a lot of uh, events up at the university on Moscow Hills, Lenin Hills. Um, but you could do this 
successfully only if you spoke Russian. You could not do it if you went looking for a conversation with a Russian and you had an interpreter with you. It obviously doesn't work. <clears throat> so I had that advantage. And I think that for those American correspondents who spoke Russian, knew something about the country before they went there. Um, they had the better opportunity to convey more information about the reality of the Soviet uh, period than, than other reporters would. And uh, reporters do tend to power around with one another. And if they are not out in the street, they're with one another and they tend to uh, do what is called herd journalism, which can be exploited by governments and often is. Just uh, to let you know, Howard Spendlow uh, has written in to confirm that it was Jerome Hines singing the title role of Boris Goodenough. Uh, good, the thank you. During thank the you very much for that, thank you. <laughs> James Lowenstein has a hand up. Please unmute and introduce. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I punched the unmute three times, so I hope it works. Uh, Marvin. <laughs> Yes, uh, hi, Jim. Um, I was curious about two things relating to uh, Khrushchev's uh, putting missiles in Cuba. Why do you think he did it? That's the first question. And secondly, what mistakes was the United States making? I mean, that was his big mistake. What mistakes were we making at the same time when it came to relations with the Soviet Union? Jim, you always have a way. <laughs> um, the first question, um, I partly answered earlier, but let me be more uh, precise. In my opinion, um, and I know this has been challenged, but in my opinion, I stick to it. What was driving Khrushchev in 1960, 61, and 62 was Berlin the division of the capital, um, the existence of Western power in a Soviet satellite state, the background of Teuton versus Slav, the Nazis against the Russians in World War II, uh, the inability of a nationalist figure such as Khrushchev ever to dismiss from the top of his mind the challenge of the Teuton to the Slav. And he wanted that problem solved. And throughout 1961, he kept threatening the West and most especially the United States and Kennedy directly in the Vienna uh, summit in June of 1961, kept threatening that, that he had to take action. And he was almost begging Kennedy, please understand, you must help me with this. And Kennedy, um, for very good reasons in defense of American interests and Western interests, said no. And what he said to him is what, he, what Kennedy said afterward to James Reston of the New York Times was it's going to be a very cold winter because he realized that they were heading into a crisis. He didn't know, in the, if you read the record of the Cuban Missile Crisis, time and time again, Kennedy keeps talking about Berlin, about Germany. Why did Khrushchev do this? In my opinion, to scare, the, to scare Kennedy and the West into having some kind of crisis summit meeting that would result in an exchange of the West out of Berlin and Khrushchev's missiles out of Cuba. Uh, we never got to that stage because uh, of everything that we know about what happened with the missile crisis. Uh, what mistakes or problems did the U.S.? Uh, Jim, my own feeling is that um, it's always very difficult to say 
to an American diplomat uh, in dealing with Russians in general, even today with Putin. Very difficult to say, when you talk to them, could you please make it that respect for the Russian people, that you respect uh, the culture of Russia, that you do not regard Russia as a, what President Obama said, as a regional power. There's no need to insult them when you get nothing for it. Um, my feeling all the time, and I've always gotten along reasonably well with Russians, although they know very well what my position is politically, um, respect them, honor their culture, and level with them about what they can and cannot do. And I hope that when uh, President Biden met with Putin uh, recently in Geneva, that he made that very clear to Putin what it is that he, Biden, President of the United States, can accept and what he can not accept. Um, I don't think that we did quite enough in that respect during the missile crisis, but I take my hat off to Kennedy and the way in which he managed that crisis that was uh, brilliantly handled. And we all can thank the Almighty that at the other end was somebody who did not want to test the resolve of the United States too much and was prepared ultimately to, as I said, cave, but in any case to give up. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. From the Q&A, we have James Shoemaker uh, asking a question. He was fascinated by Assignment Russia uh, that I'm now reading uh, the year uh, I was Peter the Great. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more, he says, about the role of our Moscow ambassadors Friday press conferences in breaking news. And I would add my own sub question to that. I mean, if this was, I don't know, five, seven, 10 years later, skepticism about American officials statements or press conferences um, would be de rigueur. Um, was there any sense, uh, and you, you do reflect on this in one particular moment that perhaps you could talk about, in which you felt that American officials uh, or the ambassador was using you, uh, you know, to communicate political points uh, for the government's advantage? Right. Well, Eric, the... Um... Somebody used to ask me when I covered Khrushchev, excuse me, when I, when I covered Kissinger, um, you know, I was always asked this question. Don't you know that the man is lying? And I would always sort of um, try to be respectful in my response. Um, yes, I did know that often he lied, but I know that often most government leaders when pressed, when in need of a, a diplomatic success, fit in one way or another. Now, to get to your point about the American ambassadors, the two that I knew best were Ambassador Bolin, who was there in 1956, and Ambassador Llewellyn Thompson, who was there from 58 to 62, I believe, or 61 maybe. Um, they were both superb diplomats. The difference between Bolin and Thompson was that Bolin openly used you. He would even say, this is, uh, this is a line I'm giving you, but he would play games with us. And it was a matter of how wise or quick we were in picking up the game and playing along with him or challenging him. And he didn't mind that one bit to be challenged. Thompson was very quiet for the most part. He did not play games with you. Uh, he did not crack jokes with you. But every now and then, you could see the sense of humor. And he was a superb diplomat. And he felt that his responsibility was to the United States. And he was very mindful 
of the danger facing the United States over Berlin. And so in his conversations, and he and Mrs. Thompson, Jane, as a matter of fact, was very helpful too in talking to the leadership of the Soviet Union and, and creating an atmosphere that allowed the ambassador and Khrushchev later when, when the social end of an occasion uh, left, vanished, um, to really get down to business. And it was easy then for Thompson to talk to Khrushchev. Uh, Bolden did not have that advantage as frequently as Thompson did. They were, um, uh, uh, Bolden's Russian was superb. He, he spoke almost native. Uh, Thompson spoke very good Russian, but he was clearly an American. Um, how did they use us? <clears throat> Thompson at one point, Thompson, because he was so, that he held back, he would, he would wait for the reporter at the Friday night, Friday afternoon session to ask the tough question. Once he began our discussion, by raising serious questions about whether Khrushchev was losing it, whether some of his power was being diminished as a result of the failure of the Paris summit. And I was sitting there saying to myself, he never does this. Why is he raising that question? And then I couldn't get anything out of, when I asked him directly, he said, oh, was I, did I do something? To, no, no, I, uh, you guys make up your own mind. He backed off, but he put it out there. He put out there the question whether Khrushchev had been politically damaged uh, by the failure of the Paris summit. And that to me was a very important story. It was an analytical piece. It wasn't a, a hard news story, but it was interesting that even someone like an American ambassador, who we could not quote, everything was on deep background, but somebody like Thompson would throw that out there for our speculation. He knew it was happening. We knew he was doing something to get us to write something. So then, Eric, the, the responsibility then is on the reporter. Do you go along with that or not? How do you write it? Um, I remember using a phrase like, um, a question has been raised here in Moscow about whether Khrushchev might now be losing some political power. A question is raised here in Moscow. I had nothing to do with Thompson, but it was accurate. And that's the way we sort of played that game. Thank you. A final question from a former AP Moscow correspondent, Andy uh, Cattell. And he simply asks, how did your mom react when you told her that you wouldn't keep your promise and continue your studies and instead would be joining <laughs> CBS News? Um, my mother, <laughs> um, I think as a result of a conversation with my father, my mother came to the conclusion that if Marvin wanted to do this, he ought to do it. And my father and I had a very special relationship and I thought he was fantastic and he thought I was pretty good too. So if I wanted to do something, he generally supported me. And my mother was not happy about my going to Moscow, but if Pop said it was okay, let's do it. Thank you. I unfortunately need to draw this to a close. And I wanna thank you, Marvin and Kelly, Christian, our webinar attendees this afternoon. Uh, this is, as Christian noted at the outset, our final Washington History Seminar of the season. We're taking August off. We'll be starting up again after Labor Day. When the pandemic initially struck and rendered in-person seminars at the Wilson Center impossible, we eventually turned to the online webinar format as an experiment. And as it turned out, it succeeded beyond our expectations, attracting audiences far larger and from far beyond the DC region than did our in-person events. If I've counted correctly, this is our 51st session wow. of the year. Wow. We're remaining online for the fall, 
Who knows what the future will bring, alas. But we remain committed to providing engaging conversations about serious history to the public. And we are pleased that so many folks remain hungry for that serious history. So we look forward to seeing, so to speak, seeing you all again after Labor Day. Christian, closing words, please. Well, you've, you've uh, said it all. Um, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Marvin and Kelly for such an amazing conversation. Um, I told Marvin before we uh, came online that we'd like to close this uh, spring summer session with a bang and you certainly did not let us down. Thank you so much and Kelly for your um, brilliant questions. Thanks to all of you for watching, for participating in this Washington History Seminar. We encourage you to sign up, sign up on our mailing list so you can get our full, full program as soon as it uh, gets out. We have a really, really great lineup in store for you. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you, stay safe, and good night.